So today there's going to be lots going on and I can encourage you to chat to all of the exhibitors. They've all got really interesting uh, offerings. We've got two breakout stages, as you probably know. Um, some of the schedule is bound to swap. We've got literally 60 different presentations and workshops. Some people are missing flights, that kind of thing. So please bear with us, but there's going to be some great talks and great presentations. Um, and if you've got any problems, try and find me or one of my team will help. So kicking off the day, today we've got uh, Stefan Tal. He was one of the original founders of Ethereum, and he's currently the CEO of Atlas Neuer, which I'm hoping I've actually pronounced correctly. <laughs> um, so please have a round of applause for Stefan. He's going <laughs> to kick off the day. Cheers. Cheers. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for taking the time and coming in so early. Usually, crypto conferences usually don't start until 11, 12, because people get up at, or go to bed around 9 a.m. in crypto. So thank you for making the effort. So today, I wanted to do something a little bit special. I wanted to revisit a presentation I've done uh, four years ago, almost, to this day, in, uh, at CoinScrum. You guys familiar with CoinScrum? Show of hands if you know CoinScrum. OK, not many. Um, CoinScrum is a, is a meetup in London. Um, you should check it out, meetup.com forward slash CoinScrum, I believe. They do a lot of things around blockchain, uh, crypto, and so on. And they're friends of the Ethereum London meetup. Let's do a show of hands of how many people know the Ethereum London meetup. A lot more. Great. Uh, so <laughs> thank you for that. Um, and um, what was interesting in reviewing this, this presentation is because um, these days, uh, after Ethereum, now I'm investing in, in early stage uh, crypto companies. And so really I should be in the crowd with you guys. And I think it's going to be a great day. Um, but I was thinking, what's, what's more important than know what to invest in is when to invest in something, right? So by revisiting the past, maybe we can learn a little bit more about what we should do in terms of investment decisions today. So that was me, obviously, in 2014. I was a little bit fatter. A little bit more hair back then. Ah, uh, good old days. Um, and um, yeah, I wanted to touch on uh, back then. I, the first thing I touched on, that's funny, because it was 2014 already, I was telling people, hey, cryptocurrency is not blockchain, right? Cryptocurrency is essentially an artifact or a byproduct, if you will, of the security mechanism that protects a blockchain, any given one, right? The game theory element that protect the blockchain have this byproduct called cryptocurrencies. They're not the main thing. And that was something I was already insisting on back then. Um, the second thing was, actually I'm paraphrasing Vitalik Buterin, the inventor of Ethereum quite heavily here, price is the least interesting element of blockchain technology in general. If you're only focusing on price, you're not looking at the right thing. Price is great. Yeah, fortune will be made and the media will be very happy talking about young guys with Lambo and people jumping off buildings because they lost everything. That's what the media loves. But you got to be a little bit smarter than that and look deep into the technology because it's the technology that will be there or not in five to ten years. And that's moving fast, very fast. I was at CC, which is the crypto community conference, uh, for, uh, conference in Paris for Ethereum just yesterday. And there were literally presentations that were outdating the presentations just from two hours prior in the space of, yeah, just a, a couple minutes. It's crazy how fast it moves. Um, so don't focus too much on price as an indicator of, oh, is this going well or not? That has nothing to do with anything. Ethereum, so remember, set out to build a decentralized web. We didn't set out to create an altcoin or yet another currency or a way to pay for your coffee or anything like that. Gavin Wood in particular came up with this concept of Web3, a decentralized web, a web of unstoppable applications that live on the blockchain and are resistant at the very least to censorship and ideally have zero downtime. That's the real purpose of Ethereum. It wasn't just another coin, so keep that in mind. And I think a lot of the companies that are presenting today are building on Ethereum. So if you care only about price, you're essentially putting your, your ladder, if you will, on the wrong wall. So you may very well go all the way to the top of the ladder, turn around and say, oh, I'm on the wrong wall here. Be careful. And then the next thing I talked about was Satoshi Nakamoto. So if you're wondering why it looks like this, I think some of you get the joke. I see, I don't mean to be offensive towards Hal, um, but in any case, um, what Nakoto built um, was two things. The first one was a cryptographic consensus which allowed um, us to interact with each other um, without 
having to rely on third parties, and that's this decentralized database, right? The so-called consensus at scale, so-called proof of work. Uh, the second thing he built was a transaction system to move value between actors. And that together, plus the third thing that I'll touch on in a minute, forms uh, what we know as Bitcoin. But what's really important to understand if you guys are new to the blockchain is that Bitcoin is not the blockchain, right? Bitcoin is an application of the blockchain. Uh, Bitcoin is essentially the first and probably the best, most pragmatic application of the blockchain Satoshi and his friends could think of back then. Blockchain, if you will, is it's like saying database, right? So MySQL, Hadoop, uh, Mongo, Redis, so on, they're databases, right? Bitcoin, Ethereum, etc., they're blockchains. And they're applications that live on top of those platforms. But it's very important not to confuse the two. It's very important to understand that blockchain is a concept, it's not a product. And unfortunately, because of the way it started, because how, how well, in a way, uh, Bitcoin did, um, it's got this image in the media that Bitcoin is the blockchain, blockchain is Bitcoin, and that makes absolutely no sense. So keep that in mind. Uh, the third thing that, um, that Satoshi wanted to build was a, a, a scripting language inside, his, uh, inside his, his Bitcoin application. And he never really got to do it. Well, uh, actually he did. If you look into the code, there's what's called opcodes that look like this op return thing. And um, he took them out and then he put them back and it was taken out again. It was a mess, basically. Um, and in the end, we don't have a scripting language in Bitcoin. And that's because, to be fair, when you launch a global currency at scale, you want to make sure that the first two principles, which is consensus at scale, and obviously immediate transactions at very low cost, that works great. And you don't want to add even more complexity in the form of a Turing complete language like Ethereum did um, that could potentially bring the whole thing down. So why do you need a scripting language in Bitcoin? What would be the use of that? Well, he wanted to look at things like escrow. So when you buy you know, on the blockchain, there are no, there are no lawyers, there's no police, right? Nobody's going to knock on your door and say, hey, you didn't fulfill this contract. So you need a system of escrow. Everything has to be backed with assets. If you sell your car, you also need to make sure that the, the person on the receiving end has the money. So everything works with escrows to, to guarantee that the transactions will go through and that to pre preserve some sort of customer protection, if you will. Multisig, um, it's when you have a large sum of money and you want to make sure that not just one person has access to it. And that's very important for ICOs. Of course, we're sitting on millions upon millions of dollars. So they want to make sure that not everyone can, well, not any given single actor can spend all the money. So they have multisig in place. And proof of sacrifice, that's a very useful feature. And by the way, try to think about, this was written four years ago. So what have you seen implemented during those last four years? That's an interesting question to ask yourself. Proof of sacrifice is when you go on a forum, say, and you know, like Reddit, for example, you see all these Sybil attacks, meaning people sock puppeting accounts, creating multiple accounts, uh, voting themselves, creating hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of accounts sometimes, in the case of government actors um, or very rich astroturfing companies. And God knows there's a lot of money in crypto and there's a lot of people doing that in crypto, bringing you know, fake news up by upvoting the same article 30,000 times. As a, a famous story on the, if you remember the internet neutrality argument, a couple of weeks ago, a month ago, there was a, a subreddit that I was on that had five members. That's not a lot. And yet the top post there was 30K upvote. How is that possible? Right? And nobody, nobody seems to really care at the Reddit management. That's not how they make their money. In fact, they kind of like the bots. It creates traffic. Why not? So having this proof of sacrifice and being able to embed this into a, a forum will be absolutely wonderful. You, you tell people, hey, you know, give us 10 bucks. And if you act correctly, you can take it out any time. But if you don't act correctly, if we see that you're cheating, we're going to keep your 10 bucks for six months. So it's going to be very, very costly to, for someone to create 30 accounts, 100 accounts. It might not be worth the hassle anymore. It won't completely prevent it, because I don't think it's absolutely entirely possible to completely eliminate civil attacks. But it's certainly possible to limit them. That's a cool application of Bitcoin, in particular in the context of having a scripting language in place. So again, here, try to think about, this was four years ago. Think about what has been executed on. So we know the scripting language in the end, Ethereum ended up building it in a Turing complete um, with a limited size tape Turing machine, if you will. Um, but why? Why wasn't it used? Think about that. So another thing that used to be tremendously popular four years ago was colored coins. Anybody raise your hand if you know colored coins? Quite a few people. So colored coins. Um, the idea was to embed extra information into the Bitcoin blockchain. And there's a series of projects that are 
and I'm, I'm grossly uh, sort of oversimplifying here, but there was a series of projects that did the same thing, MasterCoin and so on. We're all trying to embed extra information into the Bitcoin chain so that you could have smart contracts even though you didn't have these opcodes to write actual scripts in Bitcoin. So they wanted to augment, if you will, Bitcoin because they felt that it was the dominant chain, that no other chain, no other altcoin could ever take it over. So it made a lot of sense to somehow shoehorn, if you will, a scripting language. Well, it made sense to them. To a lot of people, it made no sense whatsoever. Why would you want to do that? It's like building a plane with a car, not even the car factory. You know, Bitcoin, again, is an application. It's the car. The blockchain is the car factory. Why would you want to build a plane with a car? It makes no sense. So Ethereum obviously came up, as you know, and, and, and sorted all that by creating a Turing-complete platform, which essentially means a programming language for the blockchain, and allowed people to build these applications natively, straight onto their platform. That makes a lot more sense. Now, what's interesting and the takeaway point here is that four years ago, I swear you couldn't go on a forum without hearing how ColorCoin was tremendously superior to Ethereum and would wipe it out, and Ethereum was a scam, and Vitalik was a scammer from Russia, and, and this and that. So keep in mind that at the time, we didn't have the millions and millions of dollars that we have now pouring into marketing budget, astroturfing campaign, Russian bots and whatnot. What we do now. So if it was bad four years ago, imagine what it's like now. Can you really trust what you read? The journalist at any given magazine, coin magazine or main MSM type magazine, they can buy crypto. And you know what it's like if I give this gentleman here 10 Ether, I think tomorrow you're not going to start going around saying Ether is terrible, right? Because you want it to go up in value. So he's got that sense of, hey, I'm vested now. I can't quite criticize the platform. You have to be very, very careful with what you read. Don't take everything at face value. And try to follow people like Vitalik Buterin, for example, who've been consistent over the last four years and have prioritized technology over money. Yes, he's very wealthy, but that was never his goal. I worked with him for two years. I know the guy doesn't care about money. He wears the same clothes every day doesn't own a car, and lives on a plane, doesn't have property. So, hype situation is really bad today. Beyond ICOs, that was the next thing. We knew that crypto could be used for so much more than ICOs. And so we were thinking about, hey, what about smart property? What if we start mapping homes onto the blockchain so you can sell your house on the blockchain? Wouldn't that be cool? Or your car, or whatever. You could exchange private keys, right? And you see those cars, like BMW was starting to put uh, PKI systems into their vehicles, so we knew that we could do something with this. But so far, everything has been built, in my opinion, has been very attractive to geeks. You know, futurchic models, like say Gnosis, it's absolutely brilliant, I love this stuff. I'm not sure if my mom would love this. Um, and things also haven't really been straightforward as we thought it'd be. We had a long, long list, which I touched on in the next slide, of, of applications we wanted to build. And in the end, I haven't seen many of them out there. So ask yourself, why? Why is it so hard to build this stuff? What, are there bugs? Is, it, is the language uh, that we've been given access to, are the languages good enough? And the biggest use case, obviously, that we've seen so far, though, has been crowdfunding, right? ICOs. Yeah? So what surprises me a little bit about ICOs, and some of them, not all of them, but I would say the vast majority of them are essentially Kickstarter using Bitcoin, Ether, whatever, some type of crypto money. They're not exactly decentralized, right? If I say to someone, hey, you know, uh, give me money, and uh, here's my Bitcoin address, that goes into an account that I have full control over, yeah, it's transparent in the sense that you know how much money I've received. That's kind of cool, right? I, I, I grant you that. But you don't know how I spend it, you don't know why I spend it, you don't know on what I spend it. Did I spend half the money on Lambos, or did I spend half the money on development and the rest on marketing? You don't know, there's no way for you to know. And more interestingly, I think, is that we see this uh, masqueraded, if you will, as decentralization, when in fact it absolutely isn't. So keep that in mind. As 2018, there's a lot of things that claim to be decentralized and actually just are using the lingo of decentralization, but aren't really fully decentralized, and therefore you can't trust them. Because remember, we started this whole thing because we said we couldn't trust banks, we couldn't trust Barclays and all these guys, we couldn't trust Dropbox, we couldn't trust Facebook. But now we trust these ICO guys, so let's try to think about that a little bit. Is that really what we want to do, or can we do better than this? Let's play what we've built and we haven't built. This was the first slide of my presentation when I first presented Ethereum. There was like 12 people in a room. Um, we talked about building contracts, you know, B2B contracts, so that I don't have to rely on a very expensive lawyer. Has this been done? Maybe, maybe not. I think it has been kind of done but not in a way that brought it to the mainstream, certainly. 
uh, shareholder agreements. You know, we have applications like Boardroom from Consensus, which are excellent or look great, but they're not again being used on a regular basis. Certainly our beta or alpha stage in many cases. Prediction market, that has been done. Gnosis, Augur, all the others, obviously very popular and doing absolutely great. Voting systems, that has not been done. The government has not adopted blockchain like we thought it would. The government continues using the same old voting machines that can be rigged and so on and not leveraging the transparency of blockchain, even though that's not really hard to do today. So that hasn't happened. Domain registries, yeah, it's been done, the ENS. Escrow, I would say that's now the basis of all transactions on blockchain, so we've done that. Um, smart property, yeah, Slocket, uh, Origin Protocol, uh, Renberries, they're all doing it. So that's coming. I would say that's well on its way, but it's not used. Financial exchanges, not many decks out there today. I know Gnosis working on one, Brave Nose working on another. Again, they're not out yet. It's very early, right? And you're starting to get this trend, right? A lot of things haven't been built. Why? Crowdfunding, where we talked about ICOs and insurance. We have people like Etherisk and other companies of this type that are just coming out of Alpha. It's quite interesting. So what did we want to do with Ethereum? We wanted to help people that were not mathematicians get on the blockchain by making it really easy to build applications. So if you're a web developer, you can build a, a blockchain app. And so essentially, your HTML and JavaScript, the stuff that's at the front end, that stays the same. These are the same tools that people use today to build websites. What changes is the blockchain becomes, well, it, your database becomes the blockchain as opposed to, say, MySQL or something like similar to this. And Solidity or any type of high-level language that converts back into EVM instruction becomes your middleware, if you will, your cold fusion, your PHP, your Rails, your Node, whatever. And that has worked quite well, and that led us to four years later to this, um, to this little stack that I've uh, put together, and that was mid last year. So at the top, we have the DAP browsers. Interestingly, Mist hasn't moved on that much. I thought Mist by now would have an identity system baked in, something like Uport, you know, an app store, that hasn't happened. A decentralized app store, that is, hasn't happened. Um, and mobile support also hasn't really happened. Now, on the other hand, we've seen new companies out there, Status, very interestingly, building straight native mobile applications, native mobile wallets, and that browser, very important. Parity has done a lot of things, and we're starting to see a bit of a, of a separation between what Parity is doing, which is obviously led by Gavin Wood, the former CEO of Ether, uh, CTO of Ethereum and the CPP developer at the time, and now building it in Rust. Uh, MetaMask has come up on stage, which is basically um, an extension for your browser, so you could use it to browse dApps, if you will, in Chrome or in uh, Brave, I believe. Brave integrates it natively. So that's great, but it's a lot more fragmented than I thought it'd be. And there hasn't been that, again, much development. So if any of you guys are entrepreneurs and want to build stuff, there's plenty of room. That's what I'm trying to get at here. Decentralized dApps, well, the, you know, the sky's the limit. I think stateofthedapps.com by Joris Bonte is now at about 1,200 dApps or so. And I want to touch on dApps uh, now uh, because it's a bit of a misnomer, that D in there. Messaging, we have platforms like Whisper and Telehash. They're basically how you pass messages between actors, right? And that's because you don't want to use the blockchain for every transaction. Why? Because it's expensive, it's slow, and the crypto kitties are out there locking up the, uh, <laughs> the gas limit in, in Ethereum. If you don't know crypto kitties, it's a funny app where you can trade kitties, pictures of cats, I'm not kidding. Um, and it's doing extremely well, so well that in fact it's clogging up the chain in many, many occasions and it's preventing us from doing our work. <laughs> Uh, yeah, the unstoppable blockchain was killed by pictures of cats. Uh, <laughs> storage, we have IPFS, Swarm. Uh, surprisingly, I thought Swarm would be the leader, and in the end, IPFS really took the lead. But now I, I, I saw uh, Victor Tron just yesterday, and he's doing really great with his team, and he's going to push for Swarm to actually be potentially readable from IPFS. So that's your storage layer. That's your hard drive, right? You got your state machines, the EVM. There's a lot of, there's a lot of others. Right, we got Wasm now, that's the new thing. Wasm is going to be a huge, huge thing. It's validated by 400 people at WTC. It's really, really popular, um, really exciting, and I think it could help definitely put Ethereum into the mainstream. But we have others. We have Quantum and tons of other platforms out there that are worth looking at, right? Consensus models, I mean, I, if I had listed them, the whole page wouldn't be sufficient. Proof of stake, proof of authority, proof of whatever. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we have so many of them. Um, but we still haven't seen proof of stake being released, even though we said that was, that was to be a year and a half ago. It hasn't happened. It's been a lot more difficult to implement proof of stake than we thought it'd be. 
So people are now using proof of authority as a temporary sort of stopgap measure, if you will, and you see it on uh, testnet like Robston and so on. And new technologies like from Intel, so to Flake, Poet and so on, are also very interesting and worth looking at. So I don't think we know who the winner is going to be here. Um, we do know that Ethereum is really keen on sharding, but we don't know if they're actually going to go ahead with it or if the miners are going to play ball because obviously that cuts their, their, their bread, right? They don't get their, their food anymore if they can't mine. Um, data feeds, why is it important to have data feeds? Smart contracts cannot read the outside world. If I go on a web page from England today, I don't see the same, pa same page as someone connecting from China because of the great firewall of China, right? So smart contracts being deterministic, meaning there's no room for randomness into them, cannot possibly call a web page and say, this is what the content of the web page is, this is the price of, say, corn in Zambia. They can't do that, it's not possible. They can't pull information like that. So you have to feed them with what's called an oracle, this sort of always true machine that sits outside of the Ethereum network but still benefits from some form of decentralization so they can be trusted. There's a few applications out there. Oracleizit is one of them. And Town Crier is just purely, I believe, I could be corrected here if you guys know, but I believe they're still very much in white paper stage. And that's a really interesting, uh, if I was to invest in something, that's probably one of the first thing I'd look into because smart contracts, again, don't have place for randomness. So you can't do RNGs, you can't do lotteries on smart contracts, not natively. You need to use things like Rendal. Off-chain computing is another thing you might want to look into investing. Here again, I'm trying to show you that it's not just about dApps, right? You see how much other stuff there is in this ecosystem? There's a lot more to look into and invest in than just dApps and ICOs. So cloud, EWASM, VMs, and so on, that's also a very interesting topic. Governance, obviously we've seen from the failure of the DAO that governance is a very, very important topic. We've also seen recently with all the um, current EIPs that are under a lot of scrutiny and a lot of controversy around certain EIPs out there that a governance system is needed because saying to people, hey, it's blockchain, if you don't like it, just uh, you know, write your own client. That doesn't work. People are relying on the Ethereum Foundation, Parity, and so on, and other providers like Roman Mendeleev to create clients. And if these guys all agree that it'll be a certain way, well, it's going to be tough forking our own clients and creating our own, right? We can't quite do that in the spare evenings. These guys have huge teams and a lot of money. We can't compete anymore. So we need a decentralization, decentralized government system that helps us manage this blockchain and have some sort of democracy. Whether it's a free hierarchy democracy, that's not the point. The point is we need a way to vote on the IPs from inside the blockchain and implement this modification to the blockchain, any given blockchain, via a specific language, which, by the way, doesn't exist. So if you guys want to invent something, that will be a great thing to invent. Then we have state channels. Quickly we realize, hey, blockchain is expensive. Transactions are expensive. They're slow. Sometimes they don't go through. So we need something else. State channel is basically a series of checks that you sign on both sides of the ledger, if you will, outside of the blockchain, and then you reconcile it at night, and whoever has the longest series of checks signed by their private key, of course, so you know for sure that it's them, wins. That's a very interesting technology. There's companies like Raiden working on that right now, and, and a few others. And then you have all the cryptographic network protocols that's basically untouched. RPX, as far as I know, is the only one for Ethereum. It's uncontested, and I don't think that's right. I think there should be contesting in this domain. I think we should look at obscuring some of the data that's passing by. I think we should look at anonymity um, as a, as a first-class actor. And finally, um, there's a whole slew of protocols out there, I2P, Tor, and so on, in terms of routing that hasn't necessarily been looked at from a crypto Angle, however, I've heard that Orchid was coming up pretty soon and looked quite interesting. So the key takeaway of this presentation, you'll be glad to know that it's almost over. Um, the first point I wanted to really convey through is that even if you have two years of experience in blockchain, which is a lot in blockchain, because remember, it's only nine years old, right? Bitcoin is almost just about nine years old. Um, there's some people who've thought about all your great ideas and your genius stuff that's going to make billions of dollars. Yeah, we've, we've been thinking about this for 24 months before we even got started. So now it's been four years we've been thinking about your ideas. So keep that in mind, okay? Because that's the best way to fail. How many, if I had a penny for every time somebody told me, hey, I had the idea for PayPal back in the 90s, oh, shame that PayPal did it. No, you didn't, mate. They thought about that a long time ago. And it's the same thing for blockchain, yeah? You say, oh, I'm going to do a decentralized Facebook. That's going to make a lot of money, right? Mm -mm. A lot of people working on that for years, years. So have a look first. Research before you invest. Research before you build. There is such a thing also as too early. I mean, there's great examples. I remember Virtual, World, uh, Virtual Worlds Inc. 
which was doing this really cool app on my 4086DX back in France, my old 33K modem. It was this virtual world, you could have like put your store on there, put your picture, walk around with your customized avatars, like Minecraft plus Second Life, all rolled up into one e-commerce, everything, right? Fell miserably, lost all their money. Um, I don't know, maybe then some, I heard some, one of them ended up in suicide. 10 years later, Second Life comes in with a substandard product and racks a billion dollars. So there's such a thing as too early, keep that in mind. Is it really time for decentralized insurance? Do you really, really need it now? Is there really a demand or are we just doing stuff because we can? Now, a lot of geeks do that, by the way. I'm the first one guilty. So I pick up a book about, say, Apple Swift. And the next day I'm thinking, hey, I'm gonna build a mobile game. I'm gonna make so much money. That's not how it works. You have to think about what people want. People don't care about technology. They don't care if it's using blockchain. They really don't. The companies you're gonna invest in today, tomorrow, and so on, you have to think about them from an end user perspective. Would your mom use this thing? You know, waving around made in blockchain has never convinced anyone to use anything. No one cares how Facebook works. We just cares that it works. That's it. It's useful. It's a service. There was this whole campaign, if you want to see why that's dangerous, look at when the whole campaign around build by Rails, right? If you remember that, you had to put this little sign on your says, build in Rails, build in Rails, as if anyone cared. No one cared. Where are they now? Uh, my point exactly. Um, true dApps are, aren't here yet. Yeah, so we said decentralized application, decentralized application. Well, that's living on a website. How decentralized is that? It's not. So they're talking about, okay, we're going to put the app on, say, a web server, and we have MetaMask, and MetaMask is going to read information from the blockchain, and we're going to use parity to read this stuff from a website. Well, a website's centralized, so I could uh, hijack that. I can DDoS it. The government can go and replace it with something they, they prefer. That's not decentralized. Decentralization, the way it was foreseen by Jeffrey Wilkie and, and Gavin Wood was to embed this application into a little tarball file, send it to the client through a decentralized network like Swarm, you know, BitTorrent-like network, if you will, so IPFS would, would qualify, and then decompress it into a predefined structure where you have your images, your front-end code, and so on. And when the developers want to change it, they just invalidate the signature of the package, and then the client automatically redownloads the updated version from the decentralized network. That is decentralized. Who's doing this today? Nobody. Not one. And if they say they do, they're lying, so don't listen to them. Um, keep that in mind. They're not truly decentralized. And I think a lot of people look at this because they're right. Um, that ultimately the real successes will come from hybrid solution. You know, oh, I'm an existing business or I'm a potential new startup that has a really, really good product that people really, really want to use. And I'm thinking using blockchain technology because it solves a problem I have. That's the winners. That's the guys we're going to win. Building on blockchain for the sake of blockchain, that's a loser. So, I'll finish on this. A lot of people I've heard in the corridors were talking about, oh, uh, a bit late to this, yeah, I'm a bit late to this party. Um, that's absolutely not the case. We're really much at day one, minute one of blockchain. Um, four years ago, I was talking about being at the, uh, the sort of uh, prehistory of blockchain where the fishes didn't have legs right, back then. I think now the fish are starting to grow tiny little fins and it's touching the, the earth a little bit, but we don't have monkeys yet. Yeah? So we're, it's very early on. Keep that in mind as you invest and really think about what you're investing in. Think about timing as well as what it is. That's it. So if you want to learn a little bit more, and you guys are in London, obviously, you're welcome to come and join us at our meetup. Um, it's at Imperial College on a monthly basis. We also have an ICO pitch night. So if you guys have ICOs and you want to pitch, come over. As you can see, we're very critical. So um, the, I think that brings value to the space. Um, we're, I'm also an investment fund, so if you guys have ideas of business, come and talk to me, and I have a little Twitter, if you want to make note of that, where I try to talk about blockchain and, and what's going on. Thank you very much.